You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 381 of the podcast. And in this one, I chat with Rich Gallagher. Rich is a therapist based in Ithaca, New York. We talk about Rich's therapy journey, his OCD story. We talk about disgust-based OCD, the neurobiology of disgust, and what this means for ERP. He shares plenty of stories from his own life, as well as case examples. We talk about adapting exposure and response prevention therapy for disgust-based OCD how a judicious use of safety behaviours may help, good versus bad safety behaviours, where to start when everything feels contaminated, and much more. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or the link will be in the episode description and for the month of May 2023 NoCD is offering a reduced rate of $100 per session available to a limited number of new members to help more people receive life-changing treatment to get started and access this opportunity while it's available schedule a free call with the NoCD team today thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work This podcast episode is available as a video recording on our Patreon. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. So thank you to you guys for listening. It means a lot as always. And of course, thank you to Rich for his time and information expertise on Disgust Base OCD. Without further ado, here he is. Welcome to the podcast, Rich. Well, thank you, Stuart. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on. Um... So before we get into today's topic, uh, it'd be good to hear, you know, I know you have an OCD story, so if you want to share a bit of that, and then sure. um, when and why you became a therapist. Absolutely. Now, as far as the OCD story, uh, I had fairly late onset OCD. I did, I'm almost 70 now, but I developed it in my 30s in response to a trauma. Uh, mm-hmm. I have dealt with anxiety disorders most of my life as well, so um you know, so certainly there's probably some neurological and genetic stuff in there. Um, the I became a therapist late in life in my 50s. And uh, so my background is I'm kind of a mutt. I have an engineering degree. I had a dual major at Cornell University in the 70s when dinosaurs roamed the earth on engineering and psychology. And people joke that I would build bridges to, uh when, you know, build bridges that would talk people out of jumping off of them. And, uh, but I had a long technical career after that in the computer graphics business. I moved into management and uh, got involved in managing customer contact centers, uh, started writing seriously. And in the uh, late aughts to early 2010s, I was actually one of the United States' top selling authors on customer service and was a public speaker, who spoke 40 or 50 times a year. Uh, that funded my returning to grad school for something that's always been a calling for me more than a career, which is, you know, becoming a psychotherapist and a CBT therapist. In terms of my anxiety and OCD journey, when I was in my 20s, I suffered from severe agoraphobia and lived a very limited life for many years. And uh, CBT let me out of my cage and dramatically changed my life. It allowed me to become a software executive and travel the world and, uh, and I've never lost those gains from from that intervention. And uh, this is sort of my first introduction to early 1970s style ERP. And it worked beautifully for me. Um, mm-hmm. And so I always wanted to be a CBT therapist. I consider myself a hardcore CBT therapist. Um, so to fast forward to, you know, the modern day and uh, what we're going to talk about today, which is discussed as well. Um, so I, like I mentioned, I developed OCD in, in my 30s in response to a trauma. It had two or three different themes. ERP worked really well for a couple of them, but not at all for uh, contamination fears based on disgust. And uh, it was amazing to discover in the literature and with the help of a very good therapist that I was far from alone at that. Um, Another big part of this was uh, being part of a community 
of other clinicians with lived experience and discovering that they had had very similar experiences in their treatment as well. So, um, so I'm a big fan of ERP, still my go-to. Um, I'm also, uh, have just learned inference therapy, which I'm very excited about using as well. Uh, but when it comes to contamination fears based on disgust, there's some interesting neurobiology going on with that and some different treatment strategies that I found to be personally very helpful. And I have gotten a lot of feedback about it being very helpful for uh, other people and their clients as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And um, with uh, you, you started to l- alluding to it, alluding to it there um, about disgust being in a different part of the brain than anxiety. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that's an important distinction when we think about when we're doing ERP, why it may respond differently than anxiety does to ERP. You nailed that perfectly, Stuart. Um, and this is something that we really weren't aware of until the early 2000s when they started doing uh, MRI studies on how the brain reacts when it's presented with disgust stimuli. And it's only even more recently, like within the last 10 years or so, that we've really started looking at how that affects OCD. And uh, so just a quick neurobiology lesson. Um Fear, as you know, is controlled by a part of your brain known as the amygdala, uh, which tells you that you need to uh, be aware of something that might be dangerous and gives you the physical reactions needed to fight or run away from that danger. Uh, So it controls the fight versus flight reflex, which means that it's a short-term response and it comes and goes fairly quickly. I joke that if you're going to choose a mental health disorder, you should go with anxiety all the way because compared to for example depression um it's uh it comes and goes quickly and it's also highly treatable so you know i joke i'm just joking of course there's more Mm -hmm. much more to it than that i i joke that you're one beer or you know uh one breathing exercise away from being less anxious than you were a couple of minutes ago and so now disgust is a very different emotion though um what we've discovered is that disgust is controlled by a part of the brain known as the insula, and that's tied in with your gustatory system uh, involved with things you eat. And it's designed to keep you from being poisoned by things. So it's a a different kind of survival instinct. The big difference, and this is the big clinical aspect that we've been discovering for treating it, is that when your insula is triggered by something, it goes into your long-term memory. So disgust stimuli don't habituate very quickly. Um, You know, a personal example, for example, um, decades ago, I tried artichokes for the first time. They were delicious. I had a big plate of them. And then I was throwing up all night. I can barely even look at, at an artichoke now, even 40 years later as well. And I would say that most people have probably shared that experience as well. The disgust changes very slowly, if at all. So now let's circle this around to OCD treatment. You know, the traditional um, treatment for Uh, contamination OCD in general is exposure and response prevention, where you expose yourself to the trigger and then sit with that and be fully present with it and don't distract yourself until hopefully you reach the extinction burst where, you know, suddenly your amygdala stops worrying about it and, you know, your anxiety and and triggers go down dramatically uh, at times. Disgust doesn't quite work that way. What I've discovered, what I've noticed in my own clients, you know, I was in practice for about a dozen years uh, before I retired, and I found that a lot of my own clients, their contamination cases were very sticky, Um, and uh, I often could work with them to where they were functioning better. In some cases, they were even treatment responders in terms of their Yale-Brown scores going down at least 35%. But I don't recall anybody with that cluster of symptoms really getting to where they were comfortable with those triggers, unlike other OCD themes. And that was the case with me personally. So <clears throat> so a big part of my personal journey was, um, so my OCD is pretty well managed. and um, But I reached a point as I transitioned to retirement a few years ago where I was diagnosed with a heart condition. I was put on a medication that plunged me into a severe depression, and uh, which is very unusual for me. And it sent my OCD through the roof. Um, as I started to climb out of that, I'm pretty well connected in the OCD profession. So I saw a couple of traditional ERP therapists. Um, they were not bad therapists. They were functioning the way they were trained to treat me by doing exposure. And that was their normal response to any trigger I had. And for me, it was like smearing dog poop on everything you own 
trying to get used to it and discovering that you can't. And so I found that ERP just closed me in further. The, the, the normal response to that from my clinicians was just to keep doing more exposure. And I eventually ended up traumatized and housebound from that treatment. And it was really a horrible experience for me. I finally found another ERP clinician who was really a brilliant clinician. She knew ERP extremely well, knew the ins and outs of it very well. But she was willing to listen to me in terms of what was and wasn't working for me. And we also started going through the literature. Um, people like, you know, Dr. Bumni Olatunji and at uh, Vanderbilt and Dean McKay at Fordham have been doing some very interesting studies where they started to look at the correlation between disgust and OCD and found that people with high disgust sensitivity uh, – Often that often correlated with contamination of CD. Uh, Domenico Ludwig in in Australia in 2015 published a paper that was an encyclopedic uh, summary of studies that had been done treating disgust with ERP and other approaches, and found that it wasn't terribly effective um, for disgust, and that the gains were not terribly durable either. And so. Most of these studies ended with, golly, we need to study this more. <laughs> so we're still a little up in the air about um, you know, what to do about it. Um, so this therapist and I jiggled the key in the lock for several months. And finally, we discovered something that actually had some emerging literature support that was totally game-changing, that you know got me back into the world and lifted my mood and helped me function uh, you know, more or less normally. And that was the idea. Now, everyone who's an ERP practitioner, take a deep breath here. Um, it involved using safety behavior, something that a traditional ERP therapist would, would be aghast at. And uh, it's like those horror movies where the scientist is mad. They called me mad. <laughs> and, uh, so, but what, it, what it involves was judiciously using safety behaviors to uh, get more reps to get more lots more practice in situations I was avoiding because of the triggers, not trying to get used to the trigger, but rather trying to function better and getting a lot of practice functioning better. Um, and I'll be happy to walk you through uh, the whole difference between good accommodations and bad accommodations when you're, uh, you know, trying to treat uh, disgust OCD. And bear in mind, I'm just one yawk in up the middle of, you know, remote upstate New York. Uh, and so this is not something that's been subject to a lot of research. But anecdotally, uh, ever since I disseminated this to the clinical community a year ago, I have heard a flood of responses from people saying, this was the key. This is now where people are starting to get out of their houses, starting to go shopping again, starting to do things they were avoiding. Uh, so here's how I'm going to lay it out quickly. Um, let's say you've got a new mother who has her first child, and she's thoroughly disgusted with poop, and it's really hard for her to change her baby. And traditional ERP would have them try to get used to or habituate to the poop. Um, in fact, you know, Edmund Poe and Reed Wilson's book, Stop Obsessing, I believe at one point in the book, they suggest smearing a little feces on your leg just to get used to it. Um, and that's that's an approach that uh, I have found that for disgust-based triggers often isn't very effective. And in the case of uh, uh, so let's take a veterinarian for example. You know, I have friends who are veterinarians. They describe that profession as being a flash flood of poop. And if they um, if they try to get used to the poop itself, they may never get there. Disgust triggers habituate over the course of months or years or never compared to fear, which habituates much quicker uh, in the face of ERP. So the exposure for the new mother or the veterinarian isn't to get used to poop. It's to get used to changing your baby. And that's where the safety behaviors come in. So if you are this new mother or this veterinarian and you wear gloves, for example, and that makes you comfortable enough to change your baby a lot, then what's going to happen is... You know, a week in contact with poop is going to feel horrible. Uh, a month later, it's still not going to be much fun. Six months later, after you've done a lot of reps with being in the situation, you're never going to be, you're never going to love poop. Even experienced veterinarians that I know, and I've talked to them about this, wouldn't sit in a chair with visible feces on it. But 
when the inevitable happens, they clean up and shrug and move on because the trigger mm-hmm. is softened over a very long period of time. And so that's the – so by changing the focus to situations and functioning better and by using judicious safety behavior so that – listen carefully. Unlike the habituation model where you're trying to get used to something yucky, you're making yourself comfortable enough to do a lot of practice. That has been the, that was the key for me, and uh, and I got well very quickly once we adapted that. Uh, one last thing I'll say is that uh, there's and there is some emerging literature support for that. John Abramowitz's group uh, did one study uh, with a fairly large sample that compared, uh, I think it was for spider phobia, that compared some judicious safety behaviors with ERP, and found that it was as good as ERP. Um, but more importantly, Adam Radonsky's group in Canada uh, with the late Jack Rockman um, did another study on contamination fears directly. And this was a fairly good safety behavior. In other words, you were allowed to clean yourself enough to feel safe. And they showed that that had very good outcomes. So there is some emerging literature support for that. Yeah. So that that's kind of the gist of you know what I'm thinking about discussed at this point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and... I want to unpack a lot of that, but I think what would be good is if you could share a couple more examples um, of what, of what this looks like. Um, Oh, absolutely. Um, You know, in the, in the article I recently published in the IOCDF newsletter, I I gave uh, some case studies, for example, one of them is say uh, a woman has her kitchen sprayed with insecticide because of a bug infestation. Now she can't go in the kitchen. Um, ERP would say, get you traditionally RP because what I'm I'm suggesting is also a form of ERP. Traditionally, ERP would say, get used to increasing levels of insecticide and, you know, and eventually learn to spray it yourself, for example. Um, and in my personal experience and in my clinical experience, that approach has a high failure rate for that kind of trigger. What I'd be suggesting nowadays for that woman is wear ratty clothes if you need to, wear gloves, and spend a lot of time in the kitchen making food. And uh, mm. another example is, let's say somebody has, uh, you know, contamination fears, and they're washing their hands constantly, and they're disgust based. They're not worried about getting sick or getting someone else sick. That's a fear based trigger, but they're actually worried that they'll never feel clean enough again, or maybe they won't sleep because of it. Uh, that's kind of my cluster. And in that case, <clears throat> I'd really be focusing on. The response prevention part of it. In other words, instead of saying, just sit with that yucky feeling and get used to it, what I'd be saying is, look at ways that every day you can wash your hands a little less. Um, Look at what you can do to titrate exposure to living your life, and how can you make it safer to to do less of of the compulsions that you're doing over a long period of time. And uh, Mm -hmm. this ties in with something that long before my own disgust reared its ugly head in a big way with me. Back in 2018, I published a research poster at the IOCDF conference on sort of my tweak to ERP, which is because I found a lot of my clients were really squeamish about doing even any exposure, especially the contamination clients. And so my mantra was start in your comfort zone, stay in your comfort zone, and see where you can take your comfort zone from week to week. So people would titrate their own exposures and their own extinction burst, and uh, the and it worked really well. And and now I'm a small N again. I'm one therapist in upstate New York, but I had a 90 percent treatment response rate over the course of my career with that strategy. So that ties in with it too. Um, let's take a third example um, that doesn't involve like a poison. Some people are disgusted by physical sensations, like getting something sticky on their hands. And so I have one uh, example where. Uh, somebody makes lunch for their kid to go to school every day. And the kid loves peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but, uh, but the mother, you know, hates having sticky things on her hands or or the risk of it. So she makes the kid bologna sandwiches every day, which he hates. And so my, my response again would be use whatever safety behaviors you need to be able to make peanut butter sandwiches every day. Let's strategize how we're going to deal with it if the errant bit of jelly gets on your hands. And then let's track how you're doing from week to week in terms of what your comfort level is with that exposure. And then, you know, perhaps gradually back off those safety behaviors as those triggers soften over a long period of time. Mm. So so if I'm hearing it right, around disgust 
based ACD, how you're, you're getting them back into situations that they've been invo- avoiding. And then once they slowly get used to that, then you're slowly pulling back on the compulsions. That's exactly correct. And uh, we're, we're cutting back on the safety behaviors that Sorry, you're using. Yeah. So, no, no, that's fine. Sur- that you're using surgically to get yourself back in this, in, into the situation. And uh, I'll talk in just a sec about good versus bad safety behaviors. That's a very important yeah. distinction. But I just want to make one other quick point, which is from a neurobiology standpoint, this ties in with how human beings without OCD deal with fear versus disgust. Um, as you know, if you're learning to ride a bicycle for the first time, you're taking gradual steps and habituating to the idea of having your feet off the ground and moving forward on two wheels on a bicycle. And eventually you reach that extinction burst and it feels natural to you and it doesn't feel scary anymore. And often those gains are permanent. Uh, and that's the way ERP works when ERP, ERP works really well. Um, or of inference therapy, you know, for example, you're reconceptualizing the process of how you build up those fears in your mind. Now, with disgust, though, people do get over disgust in real life, but they do it differently. They do it in the way that I've just laid out for OCD. So um, a, uh, you know, what you call a dust man on your side of the pond, what we call a garbage collector, um, they don't roll around in garbage to get used to it. They go to work every day and they get used to it by going to work and making whatever accommodations that they need to do. Uh, Paramedics, for example, um, you know, I used to live next door to a fire chief in Los Angeles of a a regional city. And he said, I've seen so many dead bodies in so many places. It doesn't bother me anymore. And in, in the case of paramedics, they don't, you know, hang out with dead bodies to get used to them. They go to work and any paramedic will tell you that their first month in the job is horrible and that it's really tough to get used to seeing people injured or killed. But, but those who stick with it, which is most of them, um, they make whatever accommodations they need. They get support, they use safety behaviors, they take a good stiff drink when they get home from work, whatever. Um, And they, they get accustomed to it. Like my neighbor, the fire chief does. So that's the neurobiology of how non OCD human beings get used to disgust. Mm. So would you like me to dive in a little bit about my thoughts on safety behaviors? Yeah, please, if you could. Yeah, good versus bad. Absolutely, because um, this is something that I think is a big stuck point for traditional ERP therapists. And the litmus test is, does a safety behavior move you towards better functioning or away from better functioning? So let's take, you know, that, that person who can't go in their kitchen. If they start you know, having Uber deliver food to them every day, that's an accommodation that's moving them towards avoidance. And that's not a good uh, accommodation. I I wouldn't be supporting that as a clinician. On the other hand, if wearing a pair of food service gloves lets them spend a lot of time in their kitchen, number one, they're going to be functioning better. They're going to get used to, they're going to have the experience of functioning better. And number two, um, it's, uh, it's going to enable those triggers to soften over a very long period of time and, and get that practice in where they can do it. So, and it's not going to fuel an increasing cycle of avoidance. That's the key to good safety behaviors is people worry that, you know, accommodations or safety behaviors in general is like giving booze to an alcoholic and it's going to fuel just getting deeper and deeper into your compulsions. And I have not found that to be the case at all with the right kind of safety behaviors. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Rockman and the Abramowitz's group, I believe, use the terminology judicious safety behaviors. And to me, a judicious safety behavior is something that facilitates functioning, is not uh, doesn't self-enable a worsening of your compulsions, and it functions exactly like crutches, which is you, know, you use a crutch when you've broken your leg so that you can practice walking again. If you try to walk without the crutch with that broken leg, you're going to injure yourself or you're going to, it's going to be incredibly painful. And that's precisely an analogy to what happens when you use traditional ERP, in my experience, with a disgust trigger. Mm. Good point. I think mean, uh, I've always looked at it as I like crutches. Another way is like scaffolding. You mm-hmm. use scaffolding so they can, they, they can do the work. Um, we, we're, we're my fear based clients. They, there will be some resistance to ERP and 
we'll, we'll have to, you know, increase motivation and connect with their values, why they're doing it and X, Y, Z. And then we Absolutely. slowly do it and they, and they will do it most of the Absolutely. time. We've discussed based OCD. I've found the resistance just so much higher. Absolutely. I, I, I find myself weeks after weeks motivating them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it almost like eat the next session we're back we've lost all of that momentum and we're back at square one trying to convince them to do a tiny exposure and there's so much hesitancy and yeah and Stuart, you we're talking about you and the rest of the world that, that's mm -hmm. been my experience as a clinician that's been my experience personally as well uh with that and that's something i actually do a lot of advocacy around in the OCD profession nowadays is the importance of listening to what is and isn't working uh, for the clients in front of you. Because as I've connected with other clinicians with lived experience who've had their own treatment, and this isn't just for discussed themes, but for other things, trauma or other things that isn't responding to evidence-based therapy the way that they wanted, um, there's behind closed doors many of us have had a shared experience of being shamed and treated as though it's our fault that the treatment isn't working mm -hmm. and, and people not listening to what is and isn't working. And so I do a lot of advocacy nowadays about how good clinicians follow the evidence, start with established first line methods and see if they work. But then at the end of the day, you really have to pay attention to whether these things are working or not. And if it's not working, it's not because they're not brave enough or they're not Zen enough or they need to come back when they're ready. Sometimes it's the wrong approach. And uh, I had that experience back in the 1970s when Freudian analysts told me that the reason I wasn't getting well from agoraphobia was I needed more Freudian analysis. So tribalism and gatekeeping has been a huge problem in the psychotherapy field. And so, you know, I, I, I try in my own general way to push back against that with the things I write nowadays. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Um, so let me look at my questions. While you're pondering that, if you want, yeah. I'd be glad to share my own story about how I stumbled into this approach in my own recovery. Please, yeah, if you so, could. <clears throat> so where, when I had my relapse, um, conveniently, we had a pandemic start as well. So we were all stuck in our houses. And I had this big motor home. You know, I'm retired now. And I had this big motor home, a uh, 30-foot motor home in my driveway. And we wanted to go out in it. And it turned out it was... Uh, it had a, a nest of, of wasps in the uh, in the air conditioning unit on top of it, which is separate from the RV. So anyway, we had somebody come take care of that, and they flooded the inside of my uh, RV with insecticide. I could not even get in that RV for almost a year. And so, and again, I tried, like your clients, I tried every fruit-flavored way to screw up the courage to do it, and I just couldn't. And so, but I got to a point where, you know, of course, I live in the northern United States where we have winter. Um, if you're not familiar with the way motorhomes work, they have cheap plastic plumbing and you have to winterize them. You have to go in and drain all the water out of it and put chemicals in it where unlike your house, if you don't do that, those pipes are going to burst and your RV is going to uh, uh, turn into a water spigot uh, from that. And, and it's a very expensive repair. So I had to go in and do that if I wanted to not just lose the RV basically. And so <clears throat> Again, working with my therapist, what I decided to do is take some ratty old clothes that I was never going to wear again and gloves and, you know, practically a space suit. Went in there and did the winterization. It was horrible. I, uh, it was, felt like World War III being in there for me. And uh, so then a month later, I had to do some more servicing before the winter came. And I went back in with, with my ratty clothes and my gloves and found it was a little less horrible. And that really intrigued me. So, um, so what I did from there is I did more of that with the same accommodations, found that fairly quickly I was okay going in the RV as long as I used my accommodations. I put a seat cover on the seat so I could sit in and I put a steering wheel cover in the steering wheel so I could use it. But here I was driving the RV. Here I was taking the RV in for repairs. Eventually, um, uh, took it down to Philadelphia and consigned it to be sold. So here's the important point, Stuart. I joke that this approach solves half my problem. I am no less I'm no more comfortable with insecticide than I was in the first instance, uh, or only marginally so. But after enough reps, I found that you know if my glove came off and I touched something that may have had insecticide on, eh, you know, mm. then I could wash my hands and move on. It wasn't as traumatic as it was when I first started the journey. 
And so that's why I'm convinced that the reps and the safety behaviors are what, and that changed my life. Um, as I went through that process, my mood lifted. I started leaving the house, shopping again. Just got back from Europe a few months ago. Uh, I discovered I like Europe a lot better than being stuck in my bedroom. And uh, <laughs> so, um, so it was really game-changing for me personally. And as I shared this with other clinicians and eventually wrote it up as a treatment protocol and shared it privately with the online community of OCD clinicians, I was stunned by the amount of feedback that I got from other people saying, this is finally what's helping my clients function better uh, uh, for the first time. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and, and, and it's great to see that your kind of pain and suffering is now transformed into helping others. I joke that it's a very rich Gallagher solution to invent my own treatment protocol for my own problems. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, so I've got a couple of questions. So, um, yeah. So speaking of resistance in, in clients, so I work mm -hmm. with children and adolescents and mm -hmm. adolescents, adol sorry, I can't speak adolescents, especially can sometimes be in my experience, a bit more resistant. Mm -hmm. Um, naturally teens are in that developmental phase and window where they're getting more independence and mm -hmm. they don't necessarily always want to listen to people. Um, and that's what makes them great to work with but at times it can it, it can be challenging um so where am i going with this uh mm -hmm. so we talked about the resistance in erp mm -hmm. um so since reading your article i've started to think with some of my clients about well what what, what do you want to be doing again what are you avoiding where do you want to be going Wonderful. yeah all of that stuff um which i i kind of always would have done from an act point of view anyway mm -hmm. but a bit more specifically for disgust now um and then trying to get them to move in that direction but what i found is the resistance is still there absolutely to, yeah to, to even go do that thing they enjoy because the other thing is the safety behaviors sometimes the safety behaviors might be hmm, are they safety behaviors they're more compulsions that they want to do that are mm -hmm. quite excessive so it's okay, me sure. drawing that line of where's a judicial use and where Absolutely. is i'm just letting them go heavy on their compulsions you know <clears throat> that's a great question and uh, and i often had to do the same kind of psychoeducation especially with young people as well one thing i often would tell a young client early on is to say you know if your if your triggers uh lead you to want your mother to stand out in the rain for three hours so you feel better that's not going to happen you know, your parents have five votes and you've got one vote as well. So a lot of our process is working with the sufferer and their family, if there's a lot of family accommodation going on, to co-create goals. And exactly like you're doing, I focused a lot on response prevention. Um, you know, so, you know, for anything, for scrupulosity, for, you know, other compulsions, um, often our goal wasn't to get used to it. Scrupulosity is a good example because, uh People who are devoutly religious, and, and I am personally, uh, find it overwhelming to purposely expose yourself to blasphemous thoughts um, that might send you to hell. And, uh, you know, I've seen that proposed as an exposure strategy. I had really good traction with people uh, looking at the fact that, you know, somebody who's suffering from a lot of scrupulosity may be driving their family crazy with reassurance. And so we co-create every week a goal for how much less reassurance you're going to try. Um, we're not going to worry about exposing yourself to the blastosauce thoughts themselves. You're going to titrate that for yourself. But the other things I would do is I'd give my clients a get out of jail free card. If they're having a bad night, compulse away. You can pull that card out if you need it. So that makes them safe and helps them buy in to co-creating those response prevention goals with people. I will tell you a dirty secret about my own practice, which is <clears throat> I've always, um, ever since I graduated from the OCD Foundation's uh, clinical training uh, a decade ago, I've always tried to humanely titrate ERP and make it easy and doable for people. That's always my bias. Um, that springs from what's worked for me personally. It springs from the fact that I'm the least brave person in the world. And it also springs from the fact that I found that it works really well uh, for people. And I had a really good, I had really good outcomes going that way. So for example, let's say a, a sexual abuse survivor comes into me and says, Rich, uh, 
you know, I've survived this horrible trauma and I don't want some male therapist like you hovering over me asking me how much exposure I've done every week. And my response to that is to go full Burger King. This is an American. Uh, Burger King is a hamburger chain. Oh, we got Burger King. Right. Okay. So our slogan years ago was have it your way. Yeah. <laughs> so I okay. joke about going full Burger King with people and saying, <laughs> we'll have it your way. Um, and early on, um, some of my contamination clients would say, hey, could I try this safety behavior to make it easier for me to practice? I go, mm, okay, sure, fine, try it. And I discovered that it worked well. So mm. so what I've learned about disgust ties in with what for me has been a general philosophy of treating people, which is to make it easy, doable, give people good outs, give them as much control over the process, and listen to what does and doesn't work for them. Mm, good point. And my next question, so maybe this is similar to say someone who has contamination, but from a anxiety fear based type contamination mm -hmm. where it's almost 90% of their home, let's say, or even more is contaminated, mm -hmm. and they have small safe spaces. So I found this a lot in teen clients, especially with emotional contamination, mm -hmm. but it's not anxiety provoking, it's disgust based. There's right, often absolutely. little to no anxiety there, at least that they report. Um, mm -hmm. And it's often around mum and dad, are the, the key yes. disgusters, you know, they're the ones absolutely. that anything mum and dad have touched, I can't touch, um, mm -hmm. which there's not a lot mum and dad haven't touched in the house, right? Um, and yeah, so it's kind of like, that's where I think I'm struggling is in where do we start? Because everything is so intense, you know, from a disgust perspective. That's a great question. Um, Alan, Dr. Alan Wegg, he's, he's a fairly prominent figure in the OCD community. He was on a, uh, national TV news magazine years ago with a case exactly like that. There was, it was with a young girl who felt her whole family was contaminated. She actually lived with another family at that point. And, uh, and Dr. Wegg, you know, in the show showed some live therapy sessions. And what he did was he went very gradually, extremely gradually, you know, baby steps, ant steps sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. On the TV show, you saw this girl moving an inch closer to mom, for example. But the follow-up a couple of years later was, you know, they interviewed her at school and she was functioning fairly normally again. So, you know, again, this gradual titration. Now, Dr. Wegg was doing straight ERP in this case, just doing it very slowly and gradually, which is what I tend to do as well when, when I do ERP. Um, and in my case, my tweak is I like to give people lots of outs and I like to focus on expanding your comfort zone rather than habituating discomfort if they're very squeamish. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, and that was kind of Dr. Wegg's, he has a fantastic video on YouTube. He has a series called OCD tips and OCD number one is what can you do? There's always something you can do. Let's say you can't touch a chair. Could you touch the leg of the chair? No? Okay. Could you touch the air around the chair? That's an exposure. Do it. You know? So, yeah. And I, I, that's been, that video has been again, kind of my, uh, my guide as well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I you wanted to that. share something Thanks. you mentioned about people being disgusted about themselves or their own bodies. And I wanted to mention a really important point for assessment. There are some good scales for disgust measurement. There's what they call the disgust scale. Um, by Jonathan Haidt and company at NYU. And that measures things like, uh, and that just measures disgust sensitivity. How prone are you to disgust? Uh, there's also disgust propensity, which is how bad it is for you. Um, and that has questions like, would you eat monkey meat? Or could you drink tea that was stirred with a cleaned fly swatter that had been used before? Or what would you think about somebody pouring ketchup on their ice cream? Um, uh, Dr. Bumni Olatunji's uh, DPSS, Discuss Propensity and Sensitivity Scale, gets more into the feeling side of it, which is, you know, how disgust affects you emotionally. Um, but with either of those, believe it or not, I don't use those scales very often because I tend to focus more on the self-report of what's triggering people and how they're functioning. So take that person who... Um, Maybe they experience sexual abuse, and as a result, they now feel disgusted by their own body or by other people's bodies. And uh, they may be more than fine watching people pick their nose or pour ketchup on their ice cream. They may score low on these disgust scales, but that one trigger is keeping them from intimacy and companionship and all sorts of things that are important in their life. So, so 
I always start with, you know, an assessment of how they're functioning, what their Yale Brown score is looking like, how OCD is affecting their life, and their self-report of what's what's tough for them. And I frankly use my gut to try to smoke out whether that's discussed or not. Yeah. Really good point. Really good point. So I guess what comes to my mind, if someone's listening to this who I'm sure many people listen to this that have sort of discussed based OCD or discussed as an emotion within their OCD that may be thinking, oh, no, this doesn't sound too promising compared to, say, if I just had anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, how would you address that? You're absolutely correct on that point. I joke that this, you know, proposed treatment protocol uh, only solves half our problem. So it doesn't uh, make the trigger itself less disgusting. And that's something that, again, I joke that most academic discuss research ends with, golly, we need to study this more. But that's really the case. Uh, dean McKay, who I think is the dean, pun intended, of discuss research, along with Dr. Alan um, uh, he did a wonderful workshop recently for uh, better, uh, better living behavioral health, where he, you know, frankly admitted that, you know, research on making disgust uh, less disgusting is still at a really early stage, and we're still feeling our way around it. Some people have proposed counter conditioning, where you you know, put competing stimuluses in place of it. Uh, Dr. McKay mentioned that, you know, one of the problems he sees with that is that uh, it's hard to find a good stimulus that overwhelms the, the bad of it. Um, I will share a quick personal story on that. Um, mm. The Jacob Fink Lamont in Germany in, I think, 2018 did a paper with a very short counter conditioning intervention with OCD sufferers and found it reduced disgust levels from 4.5 out of 5 to like four out of five, you know, big whoop. But I think that's it's a promising area. Um, uh, Dr. McKay is also looking at ways to tweak exposure to make it more effective. Um, I had an experience uh, a couple of years ago that I found fascinating, which is, of course, we're all testing ourselves for COVID. And uh, once, you know, my wife and I were testing ourselves for COVID and I got that fluid that you test the nasal swab in, uh, it, it dribbled onto my hands. And then I looked it up, of course, see what chemical it was. And it mentioned this chemical was like, they said, deadlier than cyanide. And uh, now, of course, it's at such a low concentration, it's not going to hurt me. So I wasn't worried that I was going to die or anything like that. But for me, with disgust-based OCD, the thought of having even one molecule of that substance on my hand was overwhelming. So this was an amazing transformation for me. I thought about it, and I, I read that article where it said it's deadlier than cyanide. I thought, hmm, cyanide. Peaches have cyanide, a little bit of it, and I enjoy peaches. The cyanide is actually what makes uh, peaches taste crisp and tart. So I was able to develop a mental image of this fluid as being like peaches that are delicious and not like something that was bitter and toxic. So that helped me get over a lot more quickly. So uh, I'm just one data point there. But So, yeah, uh, so I'm very interested in a lot of the work that's being done on cross -country. But how do we make poop less disgusting? you know, garbage less disgusting, real poisons. Uh, you know, uh, my big phobia is poisonous plants, for example. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to hug an oleander or a, or a poinsettia anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So that's still a work in progress. So, you know, what I would say to that client is we're all still feeling our way around that, that there are mm -hmm. ways you can function a lot better and be happier despite those triggers in your lives. And that, you know, we all need to keep up with the literature and, you know, see what's going on as we try to figure this out it now has it more attention on it yeah which is really good um but yeah but like you know you're you're an example that treatment can still work it just needs to be adapted and maybe takes a tiny bit longer exactly that's mm. exactly correct yeah cool um so a couple of different questions now so you said you're nearly 70 right that's start. correct yeah yes so let's say we could pick up the phone and call 20 year old rich Mm -hmm. uh, what would you tell him? I'd say a couple of things. First of all, I would describe my treatment pro protocol to him. Okay. Um, and secondly, um, but the other thing I'd say, and I say to all OCD sufferers, which again, this gets back to my advocacy in the field these days, I'd say if treatment isn't working for you, advocate for yourself. Don't just listen to Dr. Wonderful. Ask yeah. questions of your therapist. Get second opinions if you need to you know, connect with the community of sufferers, you know, that's out there and learn from their experiences as well. There's a lot of sense of online community. Your podcast, Stuart, has done such a great uh, job of advocating for the community nowadays. You know, listen to those podcasts um, and 
don't give up. Uh, I know that sounds very motivational, but that would be my biggest advice to 20-year-old Rich, because if there's one signature experience to my own treatment journey, it's being at that horrible, lonely place where even help isn't working for you, and you are made to feel that, oh, you're failing evidence-based treatment, so you're a failure, and there's no hope mm-hmm. for you. And that's that would be the single, big old, the, sing, the single biggest thing that I would tell 20-year-old Rich to wrap their head around. Really good point. Really good point. Yeah. And the, the phrase evidence-based treatment, obviously it doesn't mean this, but in some indirect way, in my mind, the, using the words evidence-based means we have all the answers and here's the evidence base. Whereas in reality, we have some of the answers and this is just currently the evidence we have. In 20 years, the evidence might say something completely different or have fine-tuned what we already have. So it's like <laughs> the word evidence doesn't mean perfect. It just means best we have or best we know. Yeah, You couldn't have put that better, Stuart. And honestly, if there's one trait that I think is important for any competent OCD clinician to have, it's humility and open mind, um, delighting in the company of new ideas and people with new ideas. Um, the, cause in among the community of clinicians with lived experience that I know, tribalism gatekeeping and client shaming behind closed doors is a huge problem in OCD treatment. And this comes from somebody who believes in the evidence and believes in using frontline treatment first is not going to ever suggest that people treat their OCD with mud baths or chanting. Uh, But, um, you know, um, I have an engineering degree. I'm, uh, and I used to do in my technical career, a lot of refereed research. So uh, nobody believes in the science more than I do. But I've always, from day one as a clinician, uh, come at it with with real humility towards my clients. I've always told them, "This is our best. This is our best knowledge at this point. It uh, you'll know pretty quickly if it works or not. It works about sixty or seventy percent of the time when it works, and people can do it. But if it doesn't, don't give up. We're gonna. There's other things we can look at. There's other things we can research. Uh, you know, there's other strategies. So I never gave up on clients. I never shamed them. Um, and I never acted like Dr. Wonderful where I have all the answers. And that trait is so important to people's recovery. And to. And I'm going to add another little political point here too, which is clinicians with lived experience, um, and there's more of us out there than you think, mm-hmm. um, we need a seat at the table for setting the research agenda. Um because I'm not at all critical of the people who have brought OCD treatment to the point that it's at now. Because, you know, 30 years ago, we didn't know what to do with OCD. And now we see people getting their lives back. You know, so some of the stories of people in the IOCD effort are incredibly inspirational. And on the other hand, though, as you so beautifully put it, I keep up with the literature. I, I try to read the journals and I'll see... There's a study with 40 people who get ERP and 40 people who read Golf Digest, and ERP wins. But their Yale Brown score has gone down by six points on average, and 30% of them didn't respond. That does not justify you clubbing a client over the head and saying they're failing evidence-based therapy or that there are no other options for them. So that's something that I that's something that I shout from the rooftops nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um so uh you got a billboard in upstate new york what do you want written on that billboard uh don't give up i think that's really the key is advocate for yourself uh remember that we therapists are plumbers um uh, and uh we serve you and uh you know advocate for yourself and and uh and keep up with the field and don't give a hope that you're going to get well yeah yeah, really good point. Actually, it, it comes to use the plumber plumber analogy. And and in my kitchen four months ago, we'd been having since we moved in a couple of years ago, we've been having issues with our drainage from from our main sink out to wherever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it we had yeah, and then the the washing machine would back up and spill water all over the kitchen floor and blah blah. blah. And the plumber I'd used for a while, who I'd really liked, you know, he was a really mm-hmm. nice guy and. Um, and he told me convincingly that this is the issue and that he'd done it. And if there's anything else, it might be because the pipe is going slightly uphill and that was causing the problem. 
anyway, we eventually got another plumber around the second opinion, which goes against my loyalty, but then we did it. And, <laughs> and, and he, he got one of those big metal rods in, he cut it at a different point. He like, it basically it was a fat buildup, I think in our pipes and he oh, mashed right, it all right. up and it cleared uh-huh. it out. Whereas the other guy just who hoover, tried hoovering out what was there, but that wasn't going to pull out the fat. Right. So I guess right. what I'm saying is I really like this plumber. Uh, and he was convinced that he had the idea of what was going on. In reality, he was off the mark. And this diff- so this second opinion had a different theory of what was going on. His theory proved to be right. And we haven't had the problem since. So I guess that just sharing that from like thinking of therapists. And I encourage that for my mm-hmm. own clients. If, if it's not working, please see, you know, speak to someone else because I could Me- be completely wrong here. Me too. Absolutely. Um, mm. I had a fascinating experience when I, and I've had identical experiences to yours. And I always, you know, feel people should run and not walk from any clinician that discourages second opinions or tries to tell you that there's only one way to get well and that you're failing it. Um, the, that's, that's really important. Uh, but I had a brilliant thought on the tip of my tongue and, and I'm going to try to get it. I'm going to try to reel it back in. Um, the, uh, I'm sure it'll come to me before we wrap up our interview. <laughs> Yeah, that, well, um, lastly, I was going to ask if there's anything else you wanted to share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, I think, Stuart, you've done a great job of laying out the, the mechanics of this. I hope now I, I do want to underscore that this is just, you know, one obscure therapist's experiences clinically and personally with it. It hasn't been subjected to research yet at this point. I hope it is over time. And now I know what I was going to say is Different. that. Um, we clinicians with lived experience need more of a seat at the research table. And there is no research God that keeps us out or lets us in. Uh, this is up to us to do. You know, there's we're starting to see more, a more diversity of people with lived experience making their way into academia, which is what's going to be required for this to really happen. And uh, but also it requires an attitudinal shift. Um, the. I wrote a blog about this recently about, you know, what is evidence-based and what should we call evidence-based? And the fact is you've got two very well-intentioned sides here. And, you know, the, on one side, you've got people who want to make sure that we're being treated with things that work because the signature experience of a lot of OCD sufferers is they've been through years of useless talk therapy before they get effective help. And they've often never been told about that effective help uh, by those talk therapists. So there's a militance in the OCD community to make sure that you're using evidence-based treatment, which in some cases is veered into a hostility to new ideas that we've mm-hmm. seen play out. So so my advice to everybody would be, let's delight in each other's company, let's share ideas, let's not be gatekeepers, um, and let's understand that ideas that we're keeping from people may be what's keeping them from getting well, from tremendous mm-hmm. suffering, and be open to that. And that... Uh, we all should delight in each other's company, and and uh, and those of us who have lived experience should should have a seat at the table and be part of that discussion too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, re- really good point. Really good point. Um, so yeah, lastly, is there anything else you wanted to say? Um, uh, I want to thank you so much for uh, you know giving me a megaphone on this. Uh, it's it's helped a lot of people privately, as I've shared it with clinicians. I am so grateful to the IOCDF, which has been wonderfully open to new ideas. You know, especially over the past year. I want to thank them for giving me a platform to publish this article, and I want to thank you for uh, sharing this with your your vast podcast audience, which I've been a nice. fan of for yeah. years. Thank you, I appreciate it, and it's my pleasure. You know, when I came across the article, it was it was. Uh... It was relieving and comforting for me in equal measure. Um, well, thank you. So I'm now implementing it with some of my discuss based clients, and and hopefully I see some good results. Um, yeah, keep it, me posted. Yeah, but it definitely gave me some confidence and, and courage to try something different. Wonderful. That sounds great. Mm-hmm. So, so thank you so much, Stuart. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. And thank you to our Patreons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support.
All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.